Thank you very much to the four of you for agreeing to be part of this conversation. It's a very important conversation that I believe needs to be had about the roles that you are each playing in developing and enriching the arts ecosystem across Africa. So if I first start by introducing Prince Yemisi Shilon, he established the Omoba Yemisi Adedoyi Shilon Art Foundation Oyasaf as far back as 2007. And his collection is widely acknowledged as the holder of Africa's largest and most balanced private art collection. Oyasaf holds over 7,000 artworks, including 55,000 photographic shots of Nigeria's fast disappearing cultural festivals. Prince Shilon also financed the establishment of the first privately funded University Museum of Art in Nigeria and has given a grant of over a thousand of his artworks to the Yamasi Shilon Museum of Art at the Pan Atlantic University in Lagos. Prince Shilon, you're very welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Our next panelist is Mrs. Kavita Chalaram, founder, as Ferron has said, of Art House Contemporary, an art auction house based in Lagos, Nigeria. And I'll share in a minute the story that I have about Art House and how it personally inspired me to do a lot of the work that I now do. She's also the founder of Co, an art gallery focusing on modern and contemporary art. Art House showcases Nigerian art. It offers transparency and price through its auctions. It provides critical documentation and develops the secondary art market in Nigeria. She's an avid collector and her meticulous research in art auction houses has led to the global recognition of numerous modern African masters, including Ben Wanwu, Kolade Oshinowo, Bruce Ono Brakbeya, Ablade Glover, Yusuf Grillo, and Uche Okeke, to name many. In 2015, she established a foundation also Hello. under the same umbrella, a non-profit artist residency program. Thank you very much, Mrs. Chalaram, for joining us, and thank you for all your work. Next, we have Mr. Hakim Adedeji, an art collector, patron, and advocate for Nigerian art. He's been building up his collection for over the past 36 years. He has made many public contributions to the development of the local arts ecosystem. And his most recent project, please say it for me before I, I kobomoje, was that it? Excellent, thank you. Artist in Residence, K Air, is a program in Ibano that is creating a large space in the heart of the city that provides resources for artists to reflect on and engage in critical work. He is an investment banker by day and runs and set up and established hydrocarbon advisors. And through this organization has provided artist grants for exhibitions, mentorship programs, arts education, documentation, curatorial research, the development of alternative spaces, and so much more. He's on a mission towards developing innovative programming and sustainable arts institutions that will have lasting impact on the development of Nigerian arts. Thank you very much, Hakeem. You're welcome. Finally, last but certainly not least, is Marwan Zakem, the founder of Gallery 1957, based in Accra, but also now with a London outpost that was open last year. There was a pandemic, there was so much going on, but the likes of Marwan were opening new galleries in um, some of the world's most exciting cities. Gallery 1957 has a curatorial focus on West Africa and presents a program of exhibitions, installations, performances, and so much featuring the region's most significant artists. It serves as a vital platform promoting West Africa's presence within the art scene by hosting ambitious exhibitions, providing resources for residencies, and of course, participating in international art fairs. I should mention that Marwan and Gallery 1957 have been part of every single edition of Artex Lagos physical fairs, just as Mrs. Chalaram has been as well. Um, the gallery actually evolved over, from over two decades of Marwan's private collecting since he first arrived in Senegal in the year 2000. He also recently created the Ya Asantewa Female Arts Prize and served as a, judge me a jury member on the panel, and he's previously sat on the Tate Acquisitions Committee. So, my thanks to all of you um, for being here.
Now, this conversation is one that um, we recognize as Artex Lagos is supremely important. And I'll tell you why. Um, for myself, as a young cultural entrepreneur, it's through the work of individuals such as yourselves that I've been inspired to now do the work that I do through Artex Lagos. So a little bit of a story. In 2008, I was a young Nigerian woman living in England and thinking about wanting to move back to Nigeria, but kind of dilly-dallying and going back and forth. And that happened to be the year in which Mrs. Chellerum was creating Art House. And as she was a friend of my mother's, I was volunteered as an intern to spend a couple of weeks with her and her team as they were doing this. I was 22 at the time. And um, through the work of Art House, my eyes opened up to the vast array of Nigerian artists that existed within our midst. I had known them in my childhood. My mother was a very passionate collector, but I hadn't yet seen them all presented in one breath and therefore wasn't able to fully appreciate just the vast um, array of artists that we had within the country. And Art House has gone on to spark so many different things. Eight years later, by this point, I had become a collector because, in fact, I bought my first ever work of serious art at Art House. It was a painting by Yerinde Olutu. I'll never forget it. I still have it. And then I started to collect gradually from there. And eight years on, at age 30, I was then inspired to create Artex Lagos as an art fair for West Africa, of course, for the broader um, African arts ecosystem by virtue of the relationships that I had cultivated with the artists whose works I started to collect after that I bought that first work at the Art House auction. It was a model that inspired me and so my hope is that our conversation today will inspire very many others. There may be others who are collectors, others who are passionate about the arts and the conversation today is to say are there additional contributions to the arts ecosystem that can be made and can we learn from the experiences of these distinguished individuals here with us today. So we'll move into the questioning. Um, if I start with Mrs. Chellerum, and my question is, how did you get interested in collecting contemporary art, especially art from the African continent? Your microphone is, is on the side. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello, everyone. Um, I was a collector always and had actually started collecting Indian art. Um, and then when I came here and I started living here and I saw the amazing art, I felt um, that I needed to do that over here. So quite a local um, collection. So I started off with the purely Nigerian local collection. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Chalaram. And... Um my, my next question for you would be, what made you choose to invest in something beyond just buying artworks? What was the story? Well, I th I, with India, the whole thing was the story of India, where the auction house came in and changed the whole value system of Indian art. And having seen that come up and see works that we bought appreciate so hugely, we felt that Nigeria needed, definitely needed an auction house to do the same thing. So basically to have a secondary market where you could exit with your works, you could have a transparency of price. Documentation through all our catalogs is there's not much documentation. Of course, now there's much more, but at that time there was hardly any documentation. And it really did impact the prices over here and did put um, all the artists into the forefront. People started learning and realizing from our auctions who the artists were and it gave a transparency of price, and um, so then there was value added onto the works, which was never there before. So that was really the main reason why, why we did that. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, let's um, talk as well about the art market because we all know that when we see these reports from the likes of Art Basel, for example, the art market across Africa is usually bundled with the rest of the world and usually is said to account for a very, very minuscule percentage of global art sales. Um, this is a $60 billion industry globally, but, and still ranks a lot of the works based on Western and Asian markets. 
it would be great to have your opinion on what you feel may be the true value, not asking for a number, but the true value of the art market on the continent. Well, I think it's certainly much more than 1%. Um, African art is absolutely in the forefront today um, of art. I think practically every big gallery um, around the world has an African artist in their stable. And a lot of these statistics are not given because they live in the US or they live in Europe or they live in other, in other countries, but they are from the continent. A lot of major artists like Ellen Atsui, like uh, Njidi Dike, um, like Wangichi Mutu, Julie Moretto, all these artists who are getting huge amounts of money for their works are in major auctions all over the world and contemporary sales in Sotheby's and Christie's and don't even enter African sales. So they're not really registered as artists, but they are there and they are African. So I think we're speaking for much more than what we've been given to understand as our market. Thank you. I'll turn to Prince Yamasi Shilon next. Um, Prince Shilon, your collection is renowned globally for featuring over 7,000 works of African art, spanning everything from traditional classical African art through to more experimental contemporary installations and more sculptures. In fact, I distinctly remember in 2017 at Artex Lagos when you, um, I believe, bought a number of wall sculptures by Yao Wusu from Marwan. And I remember laughing because you had said to me, I will come to the fair. I won't buy anything. And then I, next thing I saw you having this conversation with Marwan about Yao's know, stunning works. And it's just been very inspiring to see the passion that you have. It was, it was about the have. discount that he negotiated. The yeah. discount. A very hefty <laughs> discount. It's great to see the passion you exhibited. Now, in the last few years, you've endowed the Yemisi Shillong Museum of Art at the Panat. Atlantic University with a thousand works from your collection, many of which you have been acquiring over the decades. How did you decide specifically on what you wanted to engage with? Um, creating a museum is a very particular kind of institution in terms of its important role within the ecosystem. How did you take that decision, sir? Well, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Well, I found myself collecting art from the age of 19 at the University of Ibadan. I was a, an undergraduate. And uh, I started out of interest. It grew to become a passion, from a passion to an obsession. And I call it a glorious obsession now. Glorious in the sense that I am now using that interest I have in art to promote um, our culture, promote our, um, help to do transgenerational transfer, and many things like that. How did I go into, how did I take the decision? I was a guest of the American government in 2014. And um, I taught about 22 institutions in 10 days. It was hectic. Um, they took me around many, many places. And one of the things I learned, uh, particularly when I went to the Metropolitan Museum, uh, because I was a guest of state, I mean, I was, taking up there to whoever was the chief executive. And I kept asking everywhere I went, how do you fund your museum? And um, they kept telling me the process by which they fund the museum. Now I came back home. Originally, I, my idea was that I wanted to leave my collection for the next, for the world to enjoy. Uh, because I'm immortal, I'm not going to live forever. And I have seen other collectors before me who have died and their works have fizzled out. You know, they've ended up being sold in auction houses and they've left our shores. So I wanted a situation where I could put something uh, for use by humanity in Nigeria using my collection. So that is why I decided I was going to set up a museum. But then I now had the problem of deciding, was I going to set up a museum at the University of Ibadan where I studied engineering or University of Lagos, where I did my law, or University of Ife, where I did my MBA and so on and so forth. So I went around and I discovered that my works would not be safe with those institutions. So that's how I came about uh, Pan-Atlantic University, which is um, already, they have an history in having their own collections and the way they treat the works. So I entered an agreement with them and that's, that's it's all history now. It's all in, with a view to ensuring that the works of our generations 
past and our future generations have a place to showcase our culture. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Then whilst you have the microphone, I will ask you a number of questions about um, your, your practice and your work. I mean, you've talked now about capacity, right? And in capacity, we're not just talking about the monetary resources, we're also talking about skill sets. The people who can conserve these works, can work in the museums, can work in these institutions. And you, for several decades, have been very much working on capacity building within the arts ecosystem in Nigeria. Um, you've worked widely as a patron. You've supported artists for years in the production of their work. You've provided grants. You've done so much. What is your vision behind this? Um, what is it that has pulled all of this together? And then we can also speak to Kobo Moje, artists in residence, where are you now sort of channeling, channeling and formalizing this patronage? It'd be good to hear what your vision is. Okay, so, so my interest in these things is, it's, I, think, I think right from secondary school, I've always been interested in everything cultural. But when I got to England as an A-level student, um, I think we were taken to the British Museum or something. And seeing all those works literally threw me back maybe five years to when I started attending all sorts of um, cultural events in Nigeria. And that's where the interest grew. Um, as a student, I started collecting paintings, uh, but all those posters, 10 pound posters. There's, there used to be a place called Athena in London and uh, 10 pound posters, Monet and all of those works. So I collected those. I started collecting photography, um, especially black photography. And um, later when I came back to Nigeria, I realized that look, you know, the market is there, it's not established. A lot of artists are working, and of course, we haven't even talked about how parents would actually discourage you from, from being an artist in the first place. What Kobomaja seeks to do is this. We're, no, we're, not, we're not worse off, we're not, you know, our standards are not worse than what you have abroad. However, if you are a Nigerian artist or if you are a foreign artist who wants to get some inspiration from Nigeria, you could actually come there and do your thing, okay? Hopefully, if we do have that, if more people set up in Nigeria, more, more, more residences, you'd have some form of stemming of that nomadism that happens you know, here. But of course, you can't cater to everybody. But then the fact that you're here, you're actually producing work, it's actually a good thing. Yeah. You also have, let's, let's, let's take Kobomaja Air, for example. Let's take, let's take Ibadan, okay? Ibadan was the center of a lot of the cultural, a lot of the art, institu of, uh, art institutions. So you have the IFE, you have Ibadan, you have you know, the Ibadan Polytechnic, you have the university. A lot of the current legends or maybe deceased legends um, grew up there, you know, people like um, uh, Wale Shoyinka, people like, um, you know, Demasuoko, all had their practices there. The Mbari Mbayo movement was there. So there is that heritage. And if you go around the Badon, or you even go around Ife or Oshobo, which is quite nearby, you will find that you have a huge concentration of, you know, sort of culture, a huge concentration of histories that you can actually work with. You know, and that's why the inspiration was there in the first place. And that's why we think that we have the right place to put our institution. Thank you. Um, before I move on to asking Marwan um, some questions, I wanted to share that if any member of the audience has questions they may wish to ask to any of the panelists, um, please put your hand up and the team will come round to you with a small number of cards um, that you can use to ask these questions. So they'll be coming round and we'll be taking questions in a few minutes. So Marwan, um, over to you. you. You moved to Senegal in the year 2000 and um, I would imagine began collecting from that time and then eventually, several years on, founded 
Gallery 1957, which now has, I believe, three galleries in Accra and one in London. It would be very interesting to hear about your journey as a collector and then what it was that made you choose to invest in something beyond buying artworks for yourself personally. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think my journey is different to uh, most of the panelists, uh, the esteemed panelists on this, uh, on this talk. I started at a very late age. I wasn't unduly uh, interested in art at all uh, up until the time that I moved to Senegal. I think it's quite simple a uh, question of aesthetics, something about the West African aesthetic that appealed to me on a different level. It wasn't just artworks, but it was the way people dressed, the way people carried themselves about, the, the music. I mean, it was an immersive, atmospheric uh, takeover of my senses that led me to start collecting. And uh, like everybody else, I started collecting in a very small way. Uh, I was living in hotels. And as we know, in Africa, a lot of, the hotel, a lot of their artists were present in the Africa because the only walls that they had. There were no galleries, there were nothing. And I would buy from the hotels, you know, two, three pieces that were $100 or $50 or whatever it may be. And I started collecting like that, uh, slowly but surely. And then, I mean, he took the words out of my, it becomes a hobby and then very quickly it becomes an obsession. Uh, and I didn't start taking it seriously until I started to get to know the actual artists themselves. And that happened in Ghana. Uh, and it was thanks to people like Professor Glover, uh, who became quickly one of my friends, my, my mentors. Uh, and he introduced me to a lot of other artists, Kofi Agrasor, all of the modernists that we well know now. And those were the people that I started collecting and uh, commissioning works from them and going to their studios and spending a lot of time with them and really getting to know the practice and understanding more about what it is to do an artwork, not the finished product. A lot goes into it, especially in Africa, understanding their trials, their tribulations, how sometimes they couldn't get the canvas, they had to do it on jute sacks. And, and all of these things started to fascinate me. I'm an engineer by trade and I was building uh, stuff and. The way that artists use some of the materials, plastics, wood, I had never imagined that they can be used in this way. So it became really something that I, I became very interested in and I wanted to take it a step further. Uh, I didn't know how. Uh, I knew that I don't, at that point, and we're talking with 2012, 2013, at that point, I had maybe 100 or 150 artworks in my collection. I wasn't considered a, a real large collector, but uh, I knew that I wanted to do something more with the artwork. I knew that I wanted to help in another way that I was already, I think, helping artists by being a patron, by providing them with the resources, by buying, by collecting, by bringing people in to buy their works as well. I knew I wanted to do something. The commercial aspect of the gallery, I was going to, came about because I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, I saw the wealth, the breadth of talent in Ghana, especially in Ghana. All these young artists that we now work with, you can see our booth, Yawabusu, uh, Serge Atakwe Kloti, Ibrahim Ahama, Yawabusu, all of those young artists that were graduating, who had just graduated, there was a movement coming up. And these people, I found them incredibly articulate. They were dealing with social political events, not of the colonial and the slave and the other things, but of pressing issues that we have, that they are encountering right now in Africa. Lack of water, corruption, many other things that appealed to me also that I wanted to be part of this. So it was in conversations with these young artists that I began to form the idea of doing the commercial gallery by saying, okay, I'll take it a step further. I'll manage these artists. I'll display their works uh, in the hotel that I was building as well. And if anybody does has come to the Kapinski Accra, you'll see all of my uh, all of the public spaces are works of these young artists, and not the modernist artists like Abdullah Glover and I have Kofi Agwiso, who are very annoyed at me that I didn't display their works there. But for me, they had a market. You know, they were people already with a reputation. I did not think that they needed my, you know, my assistance. I thought the younger people is what needed my attention. So, you know, I saw that 
if I can collate these artists, put them together, give them the infrastructure that they required, the necessary platform, which wasn't there, bring curators and writers. If it wasn't in Ghana, I was going to bring it from abroad to write about these artists, to document these artists, to hold museum grade exhibitions with these artists in Ghana, not anywhere else in the world, in Ghana first. Let people come and see their work there, do the studio visits there, see the artists there. Then I was sure that things would take off, that if from the inside, then we go to the outside. I'm not saying that we do not show outside. We do a lot of art fairs. We need to do that because still to this day, apart from Nigeria, which has a collector base, no West African country does. And in Ghana, it's been a struggle. We're getting there. It's taking time, but I can still count the, 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 the real collectors on, on my hand that I work with personally. Uh, we still sell 70 to 80% of our work to the international market. So the international market is still important to us. We still have to be there. We still have to see, we have to be engaged. And I think, you know, 2016 is when we opened, the same time as Art X launched, actually. You were our second fair, 154 London was our first fair. And yeah, so the similar, you were also launching. Everybody saw that there was something happening and that we needed to do something. I felt that if, you know, if somebody had done it, I wouldn't have done it. If there was a commercial gallery in Ghana that I thought was reputable and respectable and was doing it on international level, I don't think I would have done it. But there wasn't, I decided to do it. And with the commercial part or the entrepreneurial part of mine, I knew that at some point, these artworks and these artists are gonna be worth a lot of money. And it's, it's proven the fact that they are. It's incredible how quickly this has come to the fruition, that these artists have gained international recognition beyond being African artists, but leading contemporary world artists. No, yeah, that's excellent. It really is. Um, and so here we are, three galleries in Accra later, one space in London later, on from 2016. Where do you wish to go next? What is your vision for the next few years? Well, uh, yeah, my, my director, Victoria, is here. So if I say my, what my vision is, she might have a heart attack now. So <laughs> we'll, uh, no, I mean, listen, I mean, at the end of the day, we've grown quite quickly, but really we've grown in order to cater for our artists. At the end of the day, the residency, you know, is something that we're very proud of. We've had that for five years, the residency. We don't give it a name, but it's a residency. We host up to 15 artists a year in our residency we provide them with everything that they require from bringing them there the logistics the accommodations and we've i mean it's it's really great because the the fact is is not only are they west african artists they're african-american artists they're brazilian artists they're from all the world and they're coming now to ghana to gain their inspiration because there is a recognized residency program there and I can't tell you how much that benefits our ecosystem as well, having these international artists come. And we host talks and we host residency programs and we've launched the Women's Art Prize as well, which is another story altogether, which is something very important. But what I'm trying to say is we are opening to cater for the amount of artists that we are taking on. So we have three spaces uh, at the moment, and we are working with 30 artists. So even the three spaces in Accra and the one space in London are not enough to care. If we wanted to show a solo show, let's say, for each of these artists, plus we do another 10 exhibitions externally, whether they're fairs or anything else. So we're running out of space, to be quite honest. So either we're going to expand or we're just going to keep what we are. Obviously, you know me, expansion is definitely something that we're going to do. And uh, I'm not going to say where we're going to expand to because I like a little bit of surprise. But next year, I think we will be expanding into two different locations. It's always been my, my you know, I've always wanted to expand in West Africa. COVID put a stop to that. I was always going to, and then I also want to expand into East Africa because now we represent quite a few artists from that region. It's an incredibly exciting region, very talented young artists a complete different aesthetic to West African. 
and a complete different kind of collector base as well. So that's something that we're looking to do. Lagos is our big brother. Nigeria, you know, is where we call our second home, Tukimi. And the thought has always been to, to have a gallery in 1957 here. Uh, it's a crowded market, but uh, we're ready to come and uh, shake it up a little bit and, you know, make, uh, make, some, make some friends and, uh, you know, and show them. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I haven't said, I'm saying I'm thinking, I'm thinking, but Lagos, Lagos, but Lagos is, you know, everybody knows that we would like to start in Lagos. So we'll see how it goes. I, I don't know where it's going to take me. I mean, the U.S. is also somewhere that I've been thinking about doing it as well. Uh, maybe not in New York, but a secondary market like Houston or Miami or something or Chicago or something like that or L.A. I think we're not quite ready for New York uh, yet, uh, but I think a secondary market, considering that, as I said, 60% of our collector base is in the US. And if it wasn't for COVID, I probably would have opened in the US before London. London is where I grew up. London is my home. It's also, you know, I, I was there during COVID. Uh, and uh, it's just the full circle for me because the gallery space in London was my family office that I was running as a contractor, as an engineer. And being in COVID and being stuck there every single day was like, wow, this is just, this will make an incredible gallery space. So I had time on my hands and I decided to do it. And, uh, you know, we haven't looked back. It's been very, very fruitful, very successful. And it allows us to engage with a different collector base, with a different artist base a culture community that we're beginning to discover. And again, it all feeds back. We come back to Ghana with them. We do the show in London, then we bring them to Ghana. You know, it's all coming back for us. It has to come back or start at the continent for us. So, Takini, we'll see. Yeah, we will see. <laughs> I would like to ask one question to Prince Yamisi Shilon, which is, you mentioned that you began collecting as a student in the University of Ibadan. Now, that was some time ago. And in this conversation, we've listened to Mrs. Chalaram talk about her auction house, um, Hakima Dereji talk about his residency and his work supporting artists, Marwan literally laying out this vision for what I would call almost like an African super gallery. Um, it would be really interesting to hear, Prince Shilon, your take on how it has been watching all of these developments over the past few decades, observing the Nigerian and African arts landscape? Well, um, to start with, um, I remember when I left Universal, but when I was in Universal, but I was collecting small, small pieces. And then I left Universal, but um, I had cost to do some internationalization, came back and found myself going to 15 Osholaki Street in Ebutabeta, where Ananobulu did this, where he lived and left it. And I saw the works of Ananobulu on the floor. In fact, uh, they were using one or two of his works to pack debt. That was how bad it was then. Um, people did not appreciate what art was all about. And um, Koladi Oshino, who also mentioned his own experience in this direction, uh, when people did not appreciate what art was all about. Um, I remember that Benimo who died uh, in the 90s, late 90s, and that his work did not sell more than one million naira by the time he was dying. But uh, Kavita knows better than I do um, how much his work goes for now. Um, I remember um, going down to Urumi, if uh, going to Kano and so on and so forth to buy, you know, antique works. And I remember when I was doing my postgraduate in Ife, uh, people knew I was collecting works. And one of the one of one of the sisters of my classmate ran to me and she, uh, told the brother to tell me that while well, they were digging their foundation in their home uh, in Ife, they came across some some works. At that time, nobody gave a damn. I'm talking about 1981. You know, the, the country was not aware of the value of these works. We were not. Everything was around government, government area. 
And I remember the first auction in Nigeria, a private auction, was done by Chike Wadiobu in 1990, I think 1998. And I remember my, my late uncles, who are dead now, uh, we were seated down there and we were, we were, we were vying for works. The best work Bruce and Oracle had sold then was 1. 1. 1.5 million. And I learned later that the buyer did not even pay, you know. So you can see how the market has grown. Of course, there was one art house that changed the whole thing. And that is art house contemporary. Um, she, she changed the scene. She changed the scene, and I think I played some role with you, Kavita. And uh, Kavita visited me when she was setting up Art House Contemporary with her husband. And they were clear with me that we are not interested in your, your antiquities. We want the modern contemporary ones. And Kavita set up this fantastic um, auction house. And she has since then make, made a difference. I found myself playing some role with Kavita and then playing some role with her competitors. <laughs> who have since fizzled out. Um, so I can look back uh, to the development. I remember somebody here who has been introduced came to Nigeria um, to do curatorial work and stayed with my foundation for about 60 days. Um, I haven't finished at uh, Seattle, in uh, Pomona College in Seattle. And she's now making waves with um, you know, I remember how the, all these things are growing. Um, we've had, I've had to, you know, I, I, I remember when I went, when the trip I said we, I went, sponsored by American government. I remember how whenever I met anybody, they say, oh, yes, we, Nigeria would have come. But, oh God, I is a Koladi Oshino, I is a this and that. And I discovered that you are running away from my country. So, we set up residency, international residency, and um, we set up um, a grant to promote scholar scholarship work for PhD scholars in Harvard, in Emory University, uh, and so on and so forth, who have come to Nigeria. Uh, we've done that all over Europe, America, uh, doing the residency both in Abel Kuta and in Lagos. And of course, uh, our artist in residency program, we have one now who is sitting down in the audience, who is uh, doing her artist in residence. Uh, Kavita does same. Kavita does a lot of residency. Kavita has grabbed some of my people, whom, um, <laughs> whom I, I gave some inroad. We Fred Upong started with me, and then he came to Nigeria under Kavita. Kavita has made him a superhuman being now. Um, so, there is some kind of, we, we all enjoy working together as a team. I don't make money from art. I, mean, I don't sell art, um, I, but I, I help the art industry uh, in, a, in the way I can within my little resources. I'm not a rich man, no. I'm just a poor man sitting for you, but I try to play my role. And Nigerian art has since emerged. It has emerged. The collectors are now increasing. Uh, many of them are silent. There are many silent collectors in Nigeria, both Nigerians and non-Nigerians. And I'm very happy to see the developments that have taken place thanks to auction houses, thanks to, um, um, you know, galleries who have played big roles. Uh, Bolali Austin Peters has done her own beat with um, Terracotta. I mean, Terra Culture, you know, of which I played some significant role too, to help that outfit grow. Uh, all pro bono, no, no interest in making money. But let us grow our culture using, and let us propagate our culture to the world. Let us show the world our identity, what we are. Uh, the whole essence is not uh, having to make money, or, but to let us make a difference because uh, at the end of the day, we should add value to society more than we met it. That is what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I believe that um, 
we have covered some very good ground here, just understanding the, the ways in which you have each approached what it is that you do. And I wanna thank you for sharing that. We have a number of questions from the audience um, and I will take two of them and just throw them out to the panel um, if anyone would like to, to, to answer the question. Um, the first question is, oftentimes artists, especially young artists, feel exploited in the collection process. What are ways, aside from skills building opportunities, that collectors can make sure that artists are honored in the process of selling and exhibiting their works? Well, I think the gallery system is really what honors artists. They take them over, they um, monitor their life and their work and their career. And I think artists on their own find it very difficult without having some kind of representation. So I think it's so important to have rep representation right from the beginning that can help your career. Once you've reached that career, of course, we know when you become quite famous, you have other galleries that come and take you from, from a smaller gallery. But the whole thing about the ecosystem of the gallery is very important for artists. Well, I think in addition to what Kavita said, uh, artists who do who undergo artists in residence with me, uh, what I do is when they are doing their artists in residence, I introduce them to galleries. I introduce them to um, you know, various um, outfits that can be useful to them. In fact, one of them this morning, who is here, can you please stand up? She's an artist in residence. Um, she had the best results from her school, uh, even beating all the men. Um, and when we were coming this morning, after taking her around, um, we were in Century 21 before coming here. Please sit down. We were in Century 21 before coming here. The whole essence is to open her up to opportunities in Lagos and uh, give her She's been taking telephone, she's very smart. She takes as many telephone numbers as possible. She has opened up her own Instagram page and uh, she's, she's out there. So what I do is um, I don't just teach them how to, because I'm, I'm, I'm a stockbroker and investment consultant. So I know a lot about uh, uh, pricing, finance, and I teach them all that, marketing, art history, and so on. I then introduce them to the art market for them to now take benefit of the art market and be able to grow. I think it's important to, it's, it's very important to appreciate there is the gallery system that needs to work for the artists. But what I have found out over the, you know, sort of over the years is this. Artists actually do need more than the money. Um, they need the material, they need, you know, whatever, but they need mentorship, okay? Mentorship is a huge part of this. And mentorship could be, could involve you just giving your opinion on what they're doing, you helping with certain decisions that they have to make. And essentially, what I have found is that a well-mentored artist knows when BS is zooming around, okay? Because he's grounded, okay? So if you have a, an artist who has been going around and you know suddenly his works are selling for so much, blah, 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 blah. A well-mentored artist actually realizes that maybe he has not done the work to get to that level. So he starts doing that work. He starts doing that research work, he starts doing you know, the work of perhaps articulating his, you know, his, his profession better. And those sort of things are either given by the galleries or the collectors or perhaps friends. The other point to note is this, and I don't know that there are many other business schools, I mean, sorry, art schools in the world. Our school system needs to be tweaked a bit. Our syllabus in the art schools all need to be tweaked because a lot of these artists, at least, I mean, I've never been to an art school, but just talking to several artists over the decades, you can realize that the school system does not prepare them for 
what happens in their career. It just prepares them for the technical aspect of that work. So I think we need to tweak the school system, the school syllabus. We need to do a lot of things to actually protect these guys and also let them realize what it is like in the outside world. Then the gallery system comes in as an icing, a big icing on the cake for them. Can I, can I just add one? I, 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 I agree with, uh, with all I, for me, one thing that I would just suggest, I mean, it's, being an artist is not easy. It's, it's not an easy profession, especially when you're young and it's your, your only profession that you're doing it full time. And we understand that at the end of the day, you have to sell to make money. Uh, for me, at the beginning part, before you get a mentorship or a residency or sign up with a gallery, it's in your, it's in your blood. You have to sell works from your studio. But what I would say is once, and this is my two artists, you know, my, uh, my experience is once you do get a gallery or you do get a residency or you are at that place that somebody is financing your work or your body of work, then I would immediately cease to sell works out of the studio. We have here in Africa quite a, a, a what is it? It's, uh, many artists continue to sell from their studio, which undermines any relationship that has between whoever the gallery or the residency or whatever it may be. It is a detriment in the long term to your career. So we understand that at the beginning, but once your career is starting and you're selling and you're working with the gallery and you do have the means to be able to, then I would just simply say to the artist, do not sell anymore from your, from your studio. Have faith in your gallery or whoever it may be that you are working with, it may not be the gallery, it may be a mentor, it may be a patron, it may be a residency, whatever it may be. And uh, more, time, more times than not, you are impeding your market. Thank you. The second question that we'll take from the audience is one that I think anyone on the panel would love to respond to. What drives your selection when you decide to buy a work from an artist and engage? Um, and with Marwan, I would even add another dimension. How do you side, decide what you keep and what you sell? Well, I mean, for me, it's very, it's quite simple to be quite honest. Uh, I've always collected what moves me, what touches me. Uh, it's never been a question of trends or, you know, everybody's buying black portraiture now, so I want to go and buy, you know, all of the black portraiture or, you know, everybody's buying a Warhol because they want to say they have a Warhol in there. It's never been of interest to me uh, as that's as a collector and, uh, Definitely when I started the gallery, all the artists that I was working with, I collected. I collected deeply, I had helped them and, uh, you know, but it's impossible uh, to continue as a commercial gallery not to have some sort of interest and be on the pulse of the trends. So as we grow, uh, we tend to take artists that we believe are the right people for the right time that complement our, uh, our roster uh, and are able to foster these relationships going forward to what I keep and what I sell. I try to keep the best works because I, you know, I'm a collector and I want to, but it's very hard to, because your collectors get angry. They walk in and they say, I want this. I want this. I want this. And I say, sorry, I bought that. You know, they'll go, you know, what's the point, you know? So it's a hard decision. It's always a hard decision. I don't know if I'm in an art fair, I don't know whether I'm happier if I sell my work or I buy something from somebody else. I don't know which one gives me more pleasure. It's really, it's really a tough call. I bought a beautiful painting uh, from a Kenyan artist that I'm really proud of and very happy from, from Dauda uh, this week. And that's made me as happy, equally happy, as nearly selling you know, the works on, uh, on, on our booth. So, so it is a bit of a tug and pull. I had a Patrick Eugene show recently, who's a Haitian American. And I fell in love with one of the paintings, absolutely fell in love. And I said to my team, you know, I'm, I'm going to buy that, put it, put it on reserve. But unfortunately, it went on Instagram or whatever it may be. And then all my collectors were like, Marwan, we want it, we want it, we want it. And I was like, 
sorry, it's not for sale. One of them, who's one of my biggest collectors, I couldn't say no to. I had to sell it to him. And I've regretted it ever since. I've had sleepless nights. Every time I walked into that exhibition and looked at that painting, I'm like, my God, what did I do? So it's a tough call, Tokini, when it comes to that. Thank you. Would anyone else like to weigh in? What drives you when selecting, when deciding to buy from an artist? Okay, so, so, so I mean, my own decision-making process is very simple. If you are doing some, <clears throat> sorry? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Is this better? Yeah. Okay, my decision-making process is very, very simple. If you are doing something, if you are treating a subject that I like, I will buy, okay? I never sell anything, okay? At least for the last 30, 35 years, I haven't sold. I've only sold two works, yeah? But the point is, Deciding to buy an artist is one thing. What I have to do is to be able to keep buying that same artist. My collection is full of artists that I have maybe 20, 30, 50 works from. And the reason is, it's very simple. If you are telling a story that interests me, okay, I will continue to collect. And the more value that I accrete in that whole thing. So I have become, you know, in my own sort of uh, way, I've become a repository of a lot of works that, you know, so somebody finished in school, I will collect his works. He's now 20, 30 years, you know, into his career. If I do collect that work, I don't necessarily need to collect the next work. If I do come across a work that he did maybe 10 years ago, a gap which I don't currently have, I will go back and do that. So that at the end of the day, if you look at that correct collection, you can actually tell a story of not just what I have, but a story of what has been done in Nigeria by a specific artist over time. You know? And that way, I feel it's, it, it's a way for me to give back to society by having that collection that says, okay, this is the history of Nigeria through this person's eyes in this number of years. So again, I don't get rid of works. Not yet anyway. My own uh, situation is, um, is guided by two factors. When I was um, just 19 years old and I started, I don't think I can tell you that I knew very much about art. I mean, I was an artist. I did art up to class three in the secondary school. But thanks to my engineering that took me out of, out of that field. But it started out of interest, out of keen interest. I think you can call it in terms of, uh, call it impulse. Impulse combined with interest. And as I went on down the line, I found myself being guided by knowledge. I did a lot of research. I traveled extensively around the world. I can't tell you the number of countries I've been in the world, but I've traveled extensively by rail, by cruise, by anything you can think about, Greyhound, around different, all the six continents of the world. And in the process, I got exposed. I got exposed to what art is all about. And so I began to be scientific in my collection. So it's a combination of being scientific and also being impulsive now let us look at the impulsive angle i collect traditional art uh, i collect antiques i have an antique dated the ninth century which is in my museum um, i have works you know 14th century 12th century name it and many of them have been carbon dated and dated uh, with thermodynamics analysis so I cannot tell you that I bought those works based on scientific basis. Uh, but I bought them out of historical um, excursion, trying to establish a kind of a relationship in a historical context and ensuring that I'm able to play in that field uh, such that if the issue comes to be discussed, I can say that. And of course, when you now talk in terms of uh, modern art, 
again, I was at the beginning pushed by scientific or let me say technical, analytical and rational thinking. Uh, I wanted the first Nigerian artist, modern artist, I know Nobulu, Akinola Shekon, uh, Okebulu, name it. I mean, I was not, I was not guided by how beautiful their works were, how good their works were, but having those works in collection, uh, ensuring that I have an historical um, content of the Nigerian art. But as I now grew into contemporary, contemporary art, and I found myself being taking my decisions in a more rational way. And that is, what is the composition? How well is the passion of the artist expressed in the work? What message is the artist pushing across? And how is he passionately pushing the, the message across? How is he expressing the cultural content in his work? How balanced is his design? What is the medium? Is it a durable medium? Is it, a, is it not durable? Uh, does he have, does the ha artist have, an, you know, a peer group? What a, you know, historical peer group, you know, that I can relate with? When did he graduate? You know, all those rational decision making. Now, so I have a basket of collection uh, that is based on rationality, interest, impulse, name it. So I cannot tell you. For instance, uh, in line with what the last speaker said, I found myself um, very intrigued by the work of David Dale because he was so very versatile. He worked in about 23 media. Um, before I knew what was happening, I was trying to collect all these 23 media and I ended up with 300 of his works. You know, yeah. Um, so, so all, some of these things are rational, some of it are impulsive, some of it are name it, but you have to have a goal for doing it. You don't just collect. You have to have a goal, you have to determine your 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 journey in collecting, and then you have to have a kind of message you are going to spend. I'll tell you about photography. You know, I, I got to a point where I had all these works of all these great artists all over centuries and blah, blah, blah. And I said, wow, what is raining now is photography. But I'm not going to buy photographs. So what I did was to recruit an in-house photographer, which I've done since 2010. And I decided to create a niche for myself in photography by sending my photographer out to 33 cultural festivals all over Nigeria, including the Benin Republic. So I established this big collection of photographs, 55,000 photographs, uh, in which I've put on a kind of uh, uh, U-stream, U, U I mean, YouTube stream. Yeah. Uh, if you go to the Yemisi Shilom Museum, you will enjoy yourself watching the Goku Festival, the um, uh, Lishabi Festival, the uh, Doba Festival, name it, up to the Voodoo Festival in Benin Republic. So, so you have to have a reason behind collection, just not to collect. You've got to determine what you want to achieve, what is your goal, and how does the artist work align with your goal. Don't just collect, have a goal. And Thank uh, you. that is it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, and to thank also our panel, distinguished panel for this conversation, thank you so much for your time. We have one last thing now, which is um, a few words from the sponsor, um, Islamic IBTC Pensions. I believe the representative is here and would like to, um, to come forward. Good afternoon, esteemed ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lyo Ilori Olaogun from Stambik IBTC Pensions. We're pleased to be the presenting sponsor of this panel conversation, Beyond Collecting, Building an Ecosystem with these acclaimed collectors and cultural luminaries which focused on these 
collectors' contributions to the art scene through their projects on the continent and in the diaspora. The insights provided have been invaluable for all existing and emerging collectors passionate about African art and its ecosystem. As Prince Yemisi Shilon um, remarked, let us grow our culture, show the world our identity and who we are. It clearly aligns with our philosophy at Stambic IBTC Pensions that whatever your dream is, we believe it can be. As a brand committed to promoting and driving Africa's growth, we are excited to be a part of this celebration of the artistic and creative strength of Africa. Kavita Shelram, Prince Yemisi Shelon, Marwan Zakem, and Hakim Adedeji, and Tokene Peterside, we thank you. In the spirit of it can be, I thank you all for joining us for this important conversation. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. The talk is now concluded. Um, panelists, please, we'll just take a couple of photos before you go. Um, there will be other talks in the Artex Talks program over the coming days. So please do check the schedule and be sure to tune in to them. Thank you very much.